Thank you very much. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Mining Solutions Design Basics, which is the third of our exciting spring webinar series. Presenting today are Doug Leach and Ellery Chernopinski from Armtech, whom I'll introduce more shortly. My name is Janine Yetke, and I'm the Director of Marketing at Armtech. My group runs Armtech's Drainage Solutions webinar program, and I'll be your host for today's event. As some of our regular attendees may have noticed, we are now offering our webinar through a new platform. With this change, we are excited to offer new functionality, including the ability to download brochures, project inquiry forms, and your CPD credit certificate right from your home screen. These documents can also be accessed through the menu at the bottom of the screen. We hope that you find these added features useful. We always look forward to questions, which we will take at the end of the presentation. Please enter your questions into the question log at any time during the presentation. Attending this session will qualify you for a one-hour technical informal CPD credit. You can track your progress toward the credit on your home screen, and at the end of the presentation, you can now download your certificate on the spot. For those who are attending as a group, please identify someone in the room to gather the required details and send the complete attendance list to drainage underscore webinar at armtech.com. Please note that this email address has changed so please uh, remember that it's drainage underscore webinar at armtech.com. I will start off with a brief introduction to Armtech. We are one of Canada's oldest and largest infrastructure companies supplying a full range of steel and HDPE-based bridge and culvert materials, as well as soil retention, stormwater management, and precast building systems. At Armtech, we provide solutions for a better world. We strive to be a leading provider of infrastructure solutions that deliver social, environmental, and economic benefits for an ever-changing world. We serve numerous sectors, including the municipal, forestry, transportation, commercial, retail, and residential construction sectors. More about how we service these can be viewed on our website or through discussion with one of our experienced sales representatives. With our centralized engineering department and regional engineers, ArmTech has the exceptional capability to fully support design and challenging engineered project requirements across the country. Presenting today are Doug Leach and Ellery Chornopinski. Doug Leach is the International Sales Manager for Armtech Drainage. With over 24, 25 years of experience, he has been involved in the specification and installation of structural projects in almost 20 countries around the world, including numerous mining projects. He has lots of interesting stories to share. Ellery Chernopinski is Armtech's Senior Sales Representative for Edmonton, North Alberta, and the Northwest Territories. He supports Armtech's full portfolio of engineered solutions, including bridge plate, multi-plate, and retaining wall products. They have lots to share today. So with that, uh, we'll now hand the presentation over to Doug. Thank you, Doug. Thanks, Janine, and welcome to all those who have joined us for today's webinar on mining application and design. Today's seminar will start with a discussion on features of structural plate corrugated steel. We'll look at its use in mining in the past and how it has changed in the last 50 years. We'll review how the product is made and used and how design procedures are used to meet the needs of today's large haul trucks, portals, and high cover tunnels. We'll suggest ways to ensure design meshes with construction and pinpoint ways to avoid problems. By the end of the seminar, Ellery and I hope we provided some guidance to smooth those difficulties of getting what's on paper up and operating in the field. I'll also mention a bit about matching the design service of that particular structure to the mine itself. 
Corrugated steel pipe products have been around for over 100 years and used in mining applications for almost as long. Mining and corrugated pipe have some common characteristics. Both have been around for a long time. Both are associated with strength. And if we look at the chart, the major uses have changed little over the past 50 years. These similarities are shown in this particular picture. Liner plate mines and caissons, roadway underpasses, and conveyor tunnels. Besides the color in the pictures, what's the difference? Well, certainly the uses are the same, but the parameters defining them have changed significantly. Today, mines are bigger and must operate more efficiently. Quick decisions based on available money, fast track construction, and all is done with attention to environmental concerns and sustainability. You, the designer, are faced with deeper portals, bigger trucks, larger conveyors, and higher stockpile, making the design much more complicated than it was years ago. To get started, I'll spend the next few minutes looking briefly at what is structural plate corrugated steel, some design methods and current design codes used. In mining, many special applications arise, and we'll look at those. On the construction side, I'll touch on assembly and some of the issues to watch out for. I know most of you, if not all, are familiar with structural plate, but I want to take just a very few minutes reviewing what it is and how it's made. Structural plate are corrugated steel sheets when bolted together form round or various shaped pipes or arches. Once buried, they act as flexible pipes, which we'll talk about shortly. Until the mid to late 1990s, Structural plate was made in a 150 millimeter by 50 millimeter corrugation profile, commonly referred to as multipoint. As demands for larger spans, heavier loads, and lower cover designs grew, Armtech developed bridge plate. It has a 400 millimeter by 150 millimeter corrugation, a profile three times stronger and ten times stiffer than multiplate very useful for mining applications. Both are made from hot rolled steel, which is slid to the correct length and width, then corrugated, punched, and curved to meet the shape of the design. There are many shapes and sizes of structural plate, including round and elliptical pipes, arches, underpasses, and box culverts. It's the ability to curve the plates which make it such a useful product. After curving, the, after curving, the plates are galvanized, nested, placed on flatbeds or into shipping containers, and shipped to the site. And once on site, the plates are bolted and field assembled. And the pile of plates, in this case, becomes a portal able to withstand over 20 meters of cover. Let's begin with how to design flexible steel structures. Modern design codes are sophisticated collections of soil steel design experience. However, they remain in some manner based on ring compression theory. It's quite simple. A load is applied downward on the structure. The outward flex mobilizes the passive resistance of the soil and provides support. And the thrust is distributed equally around the pipe wall, which acts as a series of miniature columns, each one in compression. Corrugated steel pipes are considered as flexible structures in that they flex or move under load. The load is dispersed into the surrounding soil, and that's the great thing about them. They gain their strength 
using possibly the least expensive construction material available, soil. As the pipe gathers its strength from the soil, the thin shell flexes into a lightweight steel structure supporting axial compression. The backfill envelope contributes to the strength and the two in combination become a soil steel structure capable of withstanding live vehicle or earthen bed loads. We've seen how flexible structures shed their load into the adjacent backfill. In comparison, rigid frame structures tend to attract loads, generating higher internal bending moments. This is shown in a computer simulation of soil steel interaction of both kinds of structures. The flexible structure shows smaller amounts in the steel shell than those in the rigid arch. Those moments and strains have been pushed into the soil. On the other hand, the rigid structure tends to support all of the load that's put against it. It's the combination of flexible shell and soil backfill which makes the structural plate the economical solution that it is. There are a number of design codes and procedures in regular use. Arguably, the most widely used AISI method, the American Iron and Steel Institute's semi-empirical procedure has been accepted by many. The Handbook of Steel Drainage and Highway Construction Products has served its primary resource. The book is constantly updated and has been reprinted several times. It continues to supplement modern-day bridge codes, including the Canadian Highway Bridge Design Code and American Ashto LRFD. At this point, I'll just put a quick plug in for the Canadian uh, uh, the uh, CSPI. Uh, it's run by a gentleman named Ray Wilcock in Cambridge. And if you look up uh, CSPI, Corrugated Steel Pipe Institute, Ray would be more than happy to ensure that you get your own copy of the handbook of steel drainage and construction products. Today, CHBDC and LRFD are used in virtually all highway bridge design and have been extended to off-road vehicles as well. Both codes serve as a basis for most mining applications. Mining presents the uh, Despite widespread applicability of codes, many mining projects have unique parameters not found elsewhere. Payloads of 300 tons are common. And when I say payload, that what goes in the back of the truck. It doesn't include the weight of the truck. To put that in perspective, 300 ton payload, well, you take your choice here. 60 elephants, 30 buses, or one Boeing 747 aircraft. Designs now include dead load stockpiles, 20 to 25 meters in height, wide span, wide span clearance needs, earthquake prone regions, and variable backfill materials. These parameters extend well beyond the standard scope of normal codes. In such cases, design includes the use of computer modeling. Programs such as Plaxis simulate the interaction of backfill and structure to determine stresses in the steel shell. The simulation results are then used in conjunction with standard codes to finalize design needs. This slide shows exactly how that design works. A haul road overpass was needed to carry a large mine truck and a 600 ton shovel. The arch was modeled in plaxis, which showed high bending moments in the crown and sides. As a result, this structure, shown in the top left-hand corner, was fixed with stiffening ribs to resist these loads. At this point, I'd just like to stop for a moment and uh, ask if any of you would have an interest in a Lunch and Learn program. What we do in Lunch and Learn is come into your office and ask you and have a presentation on a, on a topic that might be of interest. Uh, we'll bring lunch and we'll be more than happy to help you with any designs you may have. Please enter your email address below and we'll ensure that we can make something work. 
one of the benefits too, just while you're welcome, I'm giving you a few moments, is there uh, we can we can talk about any of your projects, probably help you out, and it's a great way for those of you who have perhaps some junior people or even more senior people who want to talk about or learn about one particular topic. Um, most of the the salespeople who would be there are experienced, been in the company for a long time. So please, please uh, enter your email address and, and we'll be sure we can look after you. I'll just give you a few moments there to fill that out and then we'll move along. Okay. Hope everyone had a chance to get that, get those lunch and learns. Uh, let's take a look at how structural plate products are used in the mining industry, and starting with the use of grade separations, overpass or underpass structures. Hull road overpass have big things to think about: live loads, dead loads, cover height, span sometimes even earthquake loads. Here's a schematic of a hull road arch. You can see it, it, this is it shown here, and we'll talk a little, about, a little bit about these loads that are coming onto it. But first of all, let's think about something else here. Besides the truck size, we also have to look at the mine's operation, which defines the traffic roads. Is the traffic single or double lane? Is the traffic going in both directions? Are the vehicles both loaded, unloaded? Or is one loaded and one's empty? Those factors all contribute to what it is that's needed to do as part of the design. Let's look at a 600 ton truck. Live loads are dispersed in a triangular shape, as you can see here down through the subbase. So the axle spacing becomes very important and loads from front and wheel lead, front and rear wheels or from side to side duels may overlap working in tandem with larger loads on the arch. Within the last five to ten years mine trucks have become so large they now generate unbalanced loading on the structure at the approach. That's what we have here. These loads tend to push the structure over and is one example of the need for finite element analysis. Some other considerations. The dead load is governed by density of the backfill and its depth above the crown of the arch. In mining, many soils find their way into the road base and hence the cover on the arch. If possible, a good sample is useful to determine the actual density. When actual valves are not available, most, code, most codes have defaults, which clearly should be identified as part of the design. Fan and rise are probably the most important factors affecting the final design and final cost. If it's a stream crossing, take the time for a good hydrologic and hydraulic study. Done carefully, it, it can save you money by sizing the, the structure very, very accurately. And if it's an underpass, ensure you get clear information on clearance box needs. Oversizing can add significantly to the final cost. Undersizing can be a disaster. The roadway width on top typically governs the, the structure length. In many applications, the roadway requires a two-foot, two-meter high berm on either side, safety berm, so keep that in mind when you're determining the length of your structure. In overpass designs, low cover heights are typically more economical for traffic flow, but structure costs increase as the cover goes down. Again, an economical solution must be determined. And remember, haul trucks typically operate at maximum grades of 15%. Always look to cut down the grade. 
as this can turn into large fuel savings. Let's talk a little bit now about the design of my portals. Listed here are the important design considerations. Topping the list is the clearance size. We need to look at portal use. Would one need a single or double entrance? By that, does one structure operate for vehicle? Perhaps the other is ventilation, or perhaps the other is a conveyor. Or is one tunnel in and one tunnel out? One needs to make the decision if it can be done with one portal or two. How do we handle drainage? As you can see, the water would return back down to the tunnel face. You have to be able to control the drainage so it doesn't, the water doesn't return to the tunnel face. Cutting the box opening to the portal face and how to make that connection. And finally, the footings. All right, when we think about our egress requirement, is there single or double lane traffic into the tunnel? Is there pedestrian traffic? utility lines or a combination of all these factors. These should all be carefully considered. I want to talk a little bit about the mine face itself, all right? Because the setting of the mine face, it determines the grade of the tunnel ramp, the structure length, and how deep it is. In this particular picture here, you can see the uh, depth of the tunnel is shown in red and the height in yellow is showing the depth of solid ground or solid rock. Typically, uh, designers like to see anywhere from five to seven meters of stable soil or solid rock above the top, the obvert of the tunnel. And so that in itself will set the depth and then you can see how those factors all contribute in the end to the length of the tunnel, the depth of the tunnel. And finally, constructability. Things such as the amount of rock removal, the mine face portal connection, or whether or not you construct a portal with or without the free flow of traffic into the mine. The picture on the far right shows a uh, portal being built at the time and vehicular traffic going around it. End treatments can be vertical cuts or elbows at the top. Again, the elbow typically will prevent rainwater from entering your portal uh, and having to collect that. Some jurisdictions require safety chambers to protect pedestrians from vehicular traffic. And one of the most critical decisions is the size of the portal cut. What we need to do is remember that we make the portal cut and a note of caution at this point. Do not make it too narrow, okay? And make an early check at the time if the portal spoil can be used as backfill. When you cut the portal out, check. It may be crushed into well-graded drainable material and meet backfill specifications. It could very well be a money saver. Assembly of the structure begins at the mine face and progresses toward the entry point. It's in the top left. If the rock is stable, the space to be reduced to that needed for assembly, the space can be reduced to that needed for assembly and backfill. This can reduce the blasting the cut and save the owner money. If you look in the top right hand picture there, you can see the room to come back now. This is where the caution is, and, and uh, Denise mentioned about a story. This is a story we had um, on one particular project. They tried to minimize the amount of blasting, and they got it to the point that they thought it was okay. Uh, what happened was it was so narrow that there wasn't room to get heavy equipment to dump the backfill in, and it ended up they had to handball and wheelbarrow virtually all the backfill in that particular area down the side of the structure. So what was perhaps saved in the blasting was certainly lost in delays and the manpower necessary to backfill in tight quarters. Combatchen and narrow spaces can be done 
with double drum walk behind rollers or diesel tap hammers. When that's done, as the backfill is moved up, the safety stations are installed, and backfill and compaction continues in 200 meter lifts until the tunnel or until the portal is full. At the portal interface, a two to three meter socket is cut into the rock wall into which the portal is set. The space can be filled with flexible meshing and covered with low strength grout. This helps to meet the, the need for ring compression and set up that uh, uh, passive resistance that we spoke about early. In some shallow portals, you can see in the bottom right, interface can be done in full rings from a crane at the top of the box cut. There's a picture in the, on the left, it's the outside of the tunnel, and on the inside of the tunnel you can see the interface. Um, you can see sort of the, the, the concrete that's been sprayed onto the mesh at that point. Footings can be set up to a maximum 15 degree slope. The picture in the top right is small, but the don't do this sign is meant to be big. The structure is bolted to special channels set in concrete footings. Please check and double check the channels match exactly those as shown. Everything depends on setting those channels. You can see them sitting in the concrete there. Extra time and your best surveyor doing that will save you a lot of problems. Let's talk a little bit about mine tunnels. These include stockpile, reclaim, escape, conveyor, and ventilation tunnels. And the main considerations are cover height, clearance needs, and possible seismic loading. In stockpile and reclaim applications, design considerations include live load, dead load, and the varying load of the stockpile itself. The tunnel use determines its size and shape. It may need to accommodate machinery or personnel using the tunnel. If possible, avoid pipe racks or conveyors attached directly to the structure. They induce point loads which require special design and structural reinforcement. What type of access points, if any, are needed in the tunnel? Do you require emergency escape route or maintenance or hopper openings? All of these should be spoke, discussed with your mine manager and also your designer. Bolted structural plates allow for assembly over live loads, which makes the product ideal for existing, for existing conveyor belts. We make a wide range of sizes for all sizes of belts from 24 inch up to 84 inch. Escape tunnels are typically connected to reclaims uh, or stockpile tunnels. Um, they often require elbows, hatchways, or connections. These are all designed under ASTM standards. And one of the things about uh, safety tunnels is it's certainly the main concern in design, and often seismic loading is considered in the design of these tunnels. Before handing the presentation over to Ellery, I want to have a brief comment on earthquake loadings and corrosion. In Canada, public roads fall under CHBDC and thus require review of earthquake loads. The load is based on a seismic event having a 10% probability of exceedance once in 50 years. There are defined seismic loads, excuse me, zones. The method for calculating the load is well defined in CHBDC using ground acceleration and dead load thrust. There is some debate on whether flexible buried structures are affected by seismic loads. Uh, just to mention what that is, because they are buried structures and they're flexible, people uh, sometimes consider that 
that flexibility is not affected by underground seismic activity. I'm not uh, the person to be able to make that decision, but it's a decision the designer must make. Public roads, however, must be evaluated for earthquake loads, but private property is generally the decision of the owner. For roads designed under AASHTO in the United States or other jurisdictions, the rules for earthquake loads apply only to locations within 10 miles of recognized fault lines. Again, this becomes the discretion of the designer on how he wants to use this information. Virtually all corrugated structures can be designed closely to match the life expectancy of the mine itself. There are numerous methods to establish structure life, but the general procedure is to look at the atmospheric side corrosion and soil side corrosion separately. Atmospheric so, uh, side being the one that is not buried and the soil side being the one that's buried in the soil. In both cases, one looks at zinc loss followed by steel loss. There are several excellent references on how this is done and those are listed. In most cases, typical life structure in mines exceeds 50 years, but over 100 years can be accomplished. If extended life service is required, that can be done through the use of Stratocat polymer coatings. Uh, the picture that you whoops, uh, sorry, there we go. Ah, the picture that you're looking at uh, shows the plate there, which has been coated. Uh, that's a polymer coat. Other options include heavier zinc thickness coatings or the use of sacrificial steel in the design. If you need more information on the Stratocat product, you may get a download copy as shown there. And so with that, I'd like to hand the uh, seminar over to Allery and he'll talk about some of the case studies. Allery? Thanks, Doug. Uh, we have a little bit of a polling question we'd like to ask, and uh, are there other ArmTech uh, drainage products that you would uh, like to hear about? Um, we do have this mining session uh, going at, um, um, right now, but uh, there could be other products you might want to um, hear uh, from ArmTech salespeople. Uh, some ideas of those would be uh, corrugated steel pipe, um, ArmTech ultraflow storm sewers, Boss 2000 HDPE storm sewers. Um, just fill in those. You may, uh, you may already have some good ideas of what those might be. Um, others would be retaining walls, uh, oil water separators. Uh, there would be liner plate, possibly some railway collector pans. Uh, we also have a new product, Howerton Trench Drain. You might be interested in hearing something about that. Uh, any of our geosynthetic lines, and uh, maybe some of our safety products like uh, guardrail. So I'll just give you a second to uh, jot those in, and then uh, we'll move on with the uh, rest of the presentation. So hello everybody, we're going to uh, go through uh, or review about five case studies related to mining projects. They're all varying. Um, this first case study is Diabic Diamond Mine. This was constructed in 2002 in the Northwest Territories. This structure is an 8 meter span by 5.6 meter rise, 2 radius arch. This ArmTech bridge plate project is showing the first steps in construction. Construction of the reinforced strip footings and placement of the unbalanced channel to the mine portal. Here you can see flying in a pre-assembled 1200 millimeter wide section of bridge plate and planting the ring on the prepared unbalanced channel that was cast into the reinforced concrete footing. Each 1200 millimeter wide section of bridge plate is bolted together with an overlapping pattern onto the previous section of placed bridge plate. 
alignment bars are supplied and are used to align holes when building these structures. The men in the center of the structure show bolt insertion from the bottom of, uh, with a long rod and a man on top spinning on the nut. One advantage for bridge plate in these applications is pre-assembly of rings, allowing for quick placement of each ring, keeping the entrance or exit way clear for traffic while under construction. That's not always the case on larger structures, but in this case, uh, very easily done. This is the completed shell assembly of an 8 meter span and 5.6 meter rise, and the total structure length was approximately 107 meters in length. With the structure fully assembled and all the bolts torqued to specification, the backfill and compaction process can be fully underway. Carefully selected backfill materials are used in the envelope surrounding the pipe and can be found on Armtex drawings. Compaction lifts are marked on the bridge plate. These are located and marked by the on-site owner's consultant or construction supervisor on the project and indicated on the pipe presented represented by red marks, if you look alongside the pipe, um, uh, you can see those red dots. Uh, it is best to use two colors to identify which compaction lift you are actually working on. With the backfill and compaction well on its way, the right sized equipment must be used to ensure for the best finished result. Armtech can assist in providing the correct sized equipment. This particular portal is on a 12% grade with a maximum overburden of 8 meters. As the portal is under varying depths of cover, the plate thickness varies for design and economy. Access for many reasons can be very important in an underground portal and this shop fabricated CSP manhole was installed in plant before arriving on site. Specifications for manhole risers varies depending on project requirements. At this point, engineered backfill has been completed. It is important to note weather conditions on site for backfilling these structures as critical to maximizing performance of these structures. This next case study is Vale Inco Birch Tree Nickel Mine. This project specified requirements for access through a downward descending tunnel at 15% grade, which Doug mentioned was a maximum, or should be considered as a maximum. The overall length of the tunnel would be 610 lineal meters from the surface to the main ore body. A deep corrugation bridge plate was selected for a portion of the decline where the soil was, weak, or was too weak to support the formed tunnel. The structure, a two radius arch shaped 6.32 meter span by 5.63 meter rise by 162 meters long was chosen. Pre-galvanized unbalanced channel were set in formwork and cast in place. The structure consisted of four pieces per ring, 1,200 millimeter wide bridge plate. Each piece was bolted together and then the ring was hoisted into place using light equipment. As part of the design criteria for this portal entrance, safety stations were required along the length every 30 meters. These design stations were 21 20 millimeter diameter multi-plate with bulkheads and reinforcement stiffeners.
The bridge, the bridge plate structure was backfilled with well-graded gra uh, aggregate or granular. Compacted uh, lift stages were a maximum of 200 millimeters with differential elevations on each side of the structure, no more than 400 millimeters in depth. To finalize this case study, the, six, well, the, the 162 meter long bridge plate utilized four different uh, plate thicknesses because of the varied, varied heights of fill over the finished structure and two bolt diameters to maintain the, the uh, seam integrity. Ventilation support, support and fans were added in later stages. So we just have another polling question for you, and uh, just wondering, do you have uh, any upcoming Canadian mining projects that uh, uh, maybe Armtech could uh, know about? So if you wouldn't mind just filling that in for a second. Then we'll get on to our next uh, case study. Thank you. So those are our results. So this next, uh, or this third case study is the Mosaic K3 potash mine near Esther Hazy, Saskatchewan, which was installed in uh, 2012. Two multi-plate structures were required to act as ventilation plenums. The diameters selected were 4450 millimeter diameter multi-plate with two 30 degree elbows, one on each end. One structure was required for the production shaft and the other for the service shaft. Armtex fabricators pre-assembled the elbows at the Guelph fabrication plant to ensure correct fit up and geometry. It was disassembled and then sent to coating prior to shipping to site. Mosaic's consultants selected Armtex Stratocat polymer coating system uh, for the corrosive nature of the potash ore. The multi-plate and flange connections were, were fully assembled on site prior to setting the structure's position to the cast-in-place underground chamber via a bolted flange connection. In addition, seam sealant tape or elastomeric butyl sealant was installed at all seams during the multi-plate assembly. The on-site contractor and craning company was responsible for rigging and lifting the assembled structures. Due to the orientation of the plenums on a 30 degree slope, controlled low strength material, CLSM, of four to six MPA was utilized for backfilling at the low end of the structure. This way, compaction requirements could be met. At the grade end elevation, a pant leg uh, type of piping arrangement or fitting was utilized and, uh, to provide ventilation to the mine's shaft. This next project was for Suncor. Uh, it utilized two bridge plate box structures. Here you see material arriving at the Edmonton staging yard compact and easily shipped. On this particular project, the intent, the intent is to assemble the bridge plate on a ridges frame of steel for pipeline protection and at the same time having a crossing pre-constructed once the, unit, the units arrived on site. Assembly, is start, uh, assembly started by attaching the unbalanced footing channel to the rigid steel frame and assembly of the bridge plate boxes on the ground. Armtech provided pre-construction meeting and assisted in field assembly tips to the iron workers on this project. Once the bridge plate boxes were ready for installation, the crane took over and hoisted the bridges 
to their footing locations on the unbalanced channel and then secured. These two bridge plate box structures were then shipped to uh, Fort McMurray via truck summer of 2016. These bridges were standard shapes for ArmTech, 4,300 millimeter span by 1,500 millimeter rise, and 6,100 millimeter span by 1,600 millimeter rise. Both were 14.48 meters in length. By pre-assembling these bridges on uh, by, pre, by pre-assembling these bridges, on-site work for installation saved Suncor time and money. This last case study is for a heavy haul road crossing at Shell Albion Sands, installed in 2010. The bridge plate high-profile arch structure was selected to provide adequate clearance for mining vehicles. Design was carried out by ArmTech. Live load design called for two CAT 797B mine trucks crossing at the same time. Final cover over the arch was between four and four and a half meters. This site, of course, is north of Fort Murray. In this next photo, you can clearly see stiffener ribs, 17 in total. These were placed on the structure to take those extra heavy loads of the CAT 797B truck loading of 714 tonnes each. For structures of any magnitude, it is a requirement to have shop assembly for fit and finish. Here two rings are fully assembled, nine plates per ring, at our George Street facility. This is true for the reinforcing ribs as well, to ensure fit and finish are met in the field. In this slide, you can see that see the footing was designed with a pocket to accept the stiffener ribs all the way to the unbalanced channel. ArmTech partnered with uh, RICO Reinforced Earth Company to deliver the headwall option you see in this slide. This MSE, or Mechanically Stabilized Earth Wall, was a ge geotextile face, uh, was used for primarily economy. The bridge plate and the geo were uh, later removed as uh, they were only to be used temporarily for this project. ArmTech can offer other uh, wall options and designs in-house such as wire form walls and bin wall, bin type retaining walls, commonly known as bin wall. Geotextile wall construction, backfill and compaction continue until the structure is completed. Thank you. I'll hand that over to Janine. Great, thank you so much, Doug and Ellery, for both of your presentations. And thank you everybody for joining today's webinar. We hope that you enjoyed the presentation and found the information valuable. Our question and answer period is coming, so please continue to submit your questions. And first I'll quickly review a few housekeeping items. As you saw in the presentation, there are a lot of considerations in mining projects and ArmTech can help support you through the selection and design process. On today's webinar platform, your home screen, there are project inquiry forms available for download to get you started. Feel free to contact us at any time for assistance. Today's webinar was the last in our spring series. We hope that you enjoyed it and will stick with us for upcoming events. Our fall series will focus on stormwater solutions and it will commence in the fall. Stay tuned for more details. Please don't forget to download your CPD certificate from the menu at the bottom of your webinar console. 
And if you are attending in a group, please send names and emails to drainage underscore webinars at armtech.com and we will send you your certificate. Please note that due to spam filter settings, emails might not get through to your inbox, so please keep an eye on your spam folder. To stay informed, please stay connected with us. You can follow us on social media, on Facebook, LinkedIn, and others. You can also get the latest on ArmTech by following us on our website, armtech.com. At the end of this webinar, there will be a quick exit survey pop-up if you have any questions or would like to request a sales call, you can do this through the survey. We value your feedback and would like to know what you think of the event. Question four will ask if you're interested in receiving more invitations for ArmTech webinar events. Due to strict Canadian anti-spam legislation, we are required to have your consent to receive emails from us. So please don't miss out and enter your email so you're on our mailing list. You can also access the survey from the survey window on your console. So now we will move to the question and answer portion of the presentation, and we'll look to see uh, what questions we have here. And uh, like we said, please feel free to add some more as we uh, walk through this. Um, so I think, uh, Doug, this would be a good question for you. Can you comment on the typical height of cover that may be required for, for hall crossing? Uh, yes, uh, it depends on a number of things. Probably the most important being the span of the structure. Uh, of course, as the span gets wider, uh, the height of cover typically gets higher. And the other thing that's very important, of course, is the load of the structure itself, uh, how big a vehicle is crossing over it, and as I mentioned, how many, how many vehicles are there. Uh, typically, what we would find for a normal mining truck, uh, your CAD 787s and those kinds of things, you end up with a cover that's typically on the order of as little as perhaps 1.5 meters to as much as 2 meters, 2.5 meters. Uh, it can get more, but that's the typical kind of uh, height of cover that we see, 1.5 to perhaps 2.5 meters or so. Thank you, Doug. Um, we have another question. Um, what is the typical time required to assemble portal or underpass structures? Hi, Doug, did you hear me? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't know if that was for me. <laughs> or okay, for, or, uh, <laughs> yes, did you, do you need me to repeat the question? Okay, yeah, please, sorry, uh, sorry, Jenny. Sure. Um, what is the typical time required to assemble portal or underpass structures? Okay, uh, that's another good question because it, it, it is uh, very important for the economy or how much it costs to actually to get the, the, the structure built, not just the cost of it. Again, uh, it depends on the size. Uh, of course, bigger, there's more plates to them, uh, as Ellery had shown there. Some of the sizes he had were probably made of three or four plates per ring. Uh, some structures may have as many as five or six plates per ring. So uh, the, the time to assemble them is a function, again, of the size and the number of plates. It would typically, a, a, a typical uh, construction crew uh, who have some experience would assemble probably on the order of five or six, well, excuse me, 20 or 25 plates per day. And that may turn out to something on the order of five, six, seven or eight meters per day, probably eight meters at the high end and, and five at the low end. What I would say at this point too as well is that there's a fairly significant, well not significant, but there is a learning curve in assembling uh, these things if you're if you're doing it probably the first two or three days or uh, four or five day learning curve and you'll wonder if you're ever going to get it done and then after the first five days it just everyone picks up and gets going so I, I, a normal kind of rate would be oh, five six meters per day 
Thank you. Um, Ellery, there's a question. Um, what portion of the project are ArmTech reps on site for during installation? Uh, that really depends on, um, I guess, uh, you know, how involved the project itself is. Uh, we, uh, we can be on site. Uh, our engineers can be on site. Uh, this, that is, the sales reps and the engineers can be on site. We can do pre-construction uh, meetings, uh, things of that nature. Uh, but um, we do have experienced outside people that can – that we use uh, uh, in, within ArmTech that can go out and uh, stay out on site for a month if you want. Um, of course, there's a charge for that, so uh, that's, uh, that's something that's available, but uh, you get a complete report, day-by-day uh, -day report on everything that, uh, that has been accomplished, and uh, uh, that's not only for your records, but for ArmTech's records as well. Thank you. Um, there's a question, how close can we build a series of tunnels, one next to the other, so as to have adequate response of soil? Doug, do you want to take I, that? Me or Ellery, sorry. Or no. wh whoever can chip in. Well, I'll take that if you like, Ellery. Uh, uh, typically, if you're able to uh, in, in the space between them, uh, if you're able to get a full compaction, there there is a now this uh, comes down to whether you're designing by code or whether you're designing, uh, I suppose, from something else. The, the, a typical code requires half the span, half the span distance between the structure. So in the simplest terms, if you have a six meter structure, uh, the code typically asks you to have three meters between the span. Uh, having said that, though, uh, it's not uncommon in confined spaces to bring it down to as little as much as perhaps a meter. Uh, whatever you need to ensure that you can get a good quality compaction effort there and enough to support the sides, uh, that's adequate. People have actually used, uh, Ellery mentioned it earlier, controlled low slump concrete as well. Uh, I, it, again, it depends on the size, uh, but it, it, you can get it down typically as low as the kind of a compaction equipment that you can get in between in order to get that uh, support that the structure needs at the sides. Um, there's another question. Can you discuss your experience with suspending conveyors from the back of access tunnels? Okay, uh, what happens when you're suspending uh, a conveyor from the roof of the structure? It's a point load. Uh, soil steel structures, as we talked about earlier, have a tendency, well, not have a tendency, but what they do is distribute the load around the structure peripherally, and the load that's applied to them comes down from above, of course, and it comes through the soil, so the load is also this distributed equally around the structure. So when you put a point load on it, um, I don't want to say it comes, it, it becomes confused, but it's, it's not really meant for soil steel structures. However, having said that, what one does uh, when you do have point loads or hanging conveyor structures from them, it's similar to that picture that, uh, for instance, that uh, Ellery had uh, of, the, of the safety station. If you put the uh, some sort of steel member around the periphery of the structure, it can support and distribute what was a point load around the outside. So uh, that's one. That's what you have to consider when you're hanging uh, hanging conveyors or anything from them. It's, you have to basically turn a point load and distribute it equally around the structure, and that's normally done with a, a, a radius uh, steel member of sorts. Um, Okay, and uh, we'll uh, take another minute just to answer the last question of the day. Um, how much is the deformation of the arch? You want that one, right, That's Ellery, or do you want me to? Well, I, I guess uh, how much is the deformation of the arch? I guess it depends on uh, 
I guess it depends on what we're talking about, whether you're talking about the construct when you're in the middle of construction or um, uh, what your final uh, span to rise ratio might be, it might end up as, but uh, they are flexible structures, so they will they will deform a little bit when you're backfilling, but uh, that's uh, that's part of the design, and then uh, that deflection uh, is supposed to have a minimum or a maximum amount of de uh, deflection in the in the structure when you're doing the backfill. I'm not sure if I answered that question right. Uh, maybe that's uh, maybe that's not what you're looking for. If not, uh, please uh, enter some. Uh, oh, good. Uh, please enter some more details, and we will get back to you by email. And I want to take this time to thank everyone and remind everyone that we uh, assist on mining projects around the world, not just in Canada. So feel free to reach out to us. It was great to have you on our presentation today, and we look forward to for you joining us in the fall. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>